title I chose for my uh, talk this afternoon uh, is Perilous Waters. I have two objectives uh, in mind. Uh, one is to simply increase your awareness uh, of the fact that in many regions of the world, many countries of the world, there is a uh, severe problem with water, water scarcity, water pollution, and so on. We're certainly in the middle of one of these regions, the whole MENA or Middle East, North Africa region, South Asia, East Asia, and so forth. A large part of the world is now facing very uh, severe problems with uh, water. Uh, but I have a second, more particular uh, motivation, and that is uh, that w whereas most of us, I think, are agreed, there's not much debate that individual nations have very severe problems with water scarcity, water supply, and so forth, but it's not always agreed that uh, there is a huge international, interstate problem uh, of water, uh, fresh water uh, supply, and so forth. Indeed, uh, there is a very considerable debate uh, in progress, has been for some years among scholars and observers, about whether it's right uh, to include water uh, among the issues that nations argue about, perhaps even uh, fight about. Uh, the, for example, one very well-known individual who's on the water peace uh, advocacy, advocacy part of the debate uh, is an Aaron Wolf, uh, very well known for many decades. He has been uh, moving about the world, espousing the view that water is special. There's something about water that's not like land. It's not like energy supplies, oil and gas, about which we know uh, nations uh, indeed have gone to war. That although wa that water is too important, too crucial a part of our lives, and that somehow that importance overrides disputes and nations are able to reach agreement. No nations have gone to war, he claims, specifically over water resources for thousands of years. International water disputes, even among fierce enemies, are resolved peacefully. Because water is so important, nations cannot afford to fight over it. Instead, water fuels greater interdependence. Well, I'm today going to offer, uh, somewhat perversely, five reasons for you to reflect on, to consider the Earth's freshwater situation uh, as perilous uh, indeed, uh, sufficiently perilous from time to time and in some places perhaps uh, to actually lead to violent conflict, not only within but perchance uh, between uh, nations as, as well. Reason number one is that growth in today's supply-demand gap in freshwater resources is historically without precedent. In so many ways, the, the Earth is changing at an extremely rapid pace, keeping most of us guessing about the future. And one of the things I think we have to guess about is what this gap in freshwater resources is going to uh, produce. Uh, one reason, of course, is that in this broad stretch of the Earth's surface, we have mounting water uh, scarcities, water stress, and so forth. Some parts of it are very, very seriously uh, affected. A major reason for this, of course, and you can notice the similarity between population density map uh, and a map of water scarcity is the tremendous growth in population. Not too many months ago, the uh, Earth passed a milestone uh, in our demographic uh, growth, and that was when demographers, or many of them, said that we, we passed seven billion. Well, the United Nations has recently revised its figures to suggest by the end of this century there will be 10.1 billion human beings on Earth, which is a fantastic growth uh, in numbers. And of course, uh, as you can see from this map, certain regions, particularly South Asia uh, and uh, East Asia, for example, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and so forth, there in that very dark color suggests a, a rather, uh, not necessarily a dark demographic future, but certainly a demographic future faced with spectacular growth in numbers. India today has about 1.1 billion people. By mid-century, which is not long from now, maybe 38 years, uh, that's just a moment in time, India is going to have an estimated 1.6 billion people. That's 500 million additional people uh, in India. So just numbers alone uh, in these parts of the world are going to change at a phenomenal pace in the future 
increasing demand, increasing all of the problems associated with water uh, supply. Uh, let me go back uh, here for a moment. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is it's not just numbers, it's also lifestyle uh, of these people, uh, which are likely to change with growing prosperity and urbanization. Urbanization is another demographic pattern that's just phenomenal in the region. China is heading by mid-century towards 221 cities with over a million population. Now maybe that doesn't impress you. By that time, 75% of the Chinese will be living in cities. Europe today only has 43 cities with more than a million population. So for China to reach 221, many of them with many millions and so forth, uh, represents a tremendous change in lifestyle. Now what if all of those Chinese urbanites decide to acquire the same standard of lifestyle as experienced in some Western societies where the expectation is we'll have one or two showers a day and maybe four or five water taps in the household and a nice green lawn and maybe a golf course uh, down the road and so forth. If all of the Chinese or Indians or Pakistanis decide to move in that direction, a phenomenal change uh, faces us tremendous pressures on uh, water supply. Now on top of all of that, of course, is what we all know increasingly about, uh, which is climate change, which will have a host of impacts upon uh, the water circumstances of the globe. Now I know that there have been uh, some reports of exaggeration about glacial retreat, uh, and it's true that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report made a grievous error of quoting an Indian uh, hydrologist to the effect that all of the glaciers in the Himalayan mountain ranges, and there are scores of thousands of them, would be gone within 35 years. That's poppycock, absolutely preposterous. They will not be gone, but believe me, they are in retreat. The evidence is overwhelming. Now, yes, there are some that are stable. I visited one, the Siachen Glacier, the far north of Kashmir, and it seems to have stabilized uh, in recent decades. And there are some you can find that are actually advancing. But trust me, most of the world's glaciers, there are scores of thousands in the Himalayas alone, are in retreat. There are hundreds of uh, glaciologists on Earth busily examining them in, in many different ways uh, and are reporting a steady volume of scientific research that the, indeed the world's glaciers are in retreat. This is very important for certain nations like Pakistan because the Indus River is dependent upon glacial melt, ice and snow melt, for about 50% of its waters. So for a country that has that kind of dependence on glacial fed rivers, and which also, Pakistan is also number one in the world in dependence upon irrigation. This is a matter of enormous importance to that nation, also very important uh, to India. This, of course, uh, what I've said accounts for the fact that speaking of the gap, here is that although Asia looks to be, to have a formidable supply of water better than any other region, when you look at it in per capita terms and so forth, Asia comes out looking the worst of all the regions uh, in the world. Second reason, transboundary rivers contain inherent grounds for conflict between upper and lower riparians. A good part of Asia, uh, for example, uh, is uh, contained within uh, international or transboundary uh, basins. And we don't have time to go through all of them, but if you just pick out one, uh, the Indus Basin, for example, and recognize that India and Pakistan have been at odds for 65 years, you recognize this tremendous basis of animosity with or without water scarcity uh, for them to have waged war on a number of occasions. The same applies to other regions. If you look at the Nile Basin countries, for example, we now have 11 countries sharing in that basin. The newest, only months old, is the South Sudan. Uh, well, there's already, there are reports that the Sudan and South Sudan may soon be at war. There certainly is some military violence uh, in progress. And you can understand that achieving an agreement just between the two Sudans over water may prove difficult. But notice that upriver, on the Blue Nile, the Blue Nile supplies about 80% of the freshwater supply to Egypt. Uh, and so any dam building activity, any increased irrigation uh, efforts by the Ethiopians is very likely to create animosities and difficulties 
uh, with the Egyptians. And of course, uh, Ethiopia has no choice but to attend to its irrigation and its hydropower because it's rapidly moving up to a population by mid-century of about 185 million people. It, it will be one of the most populated states. It has no choice but to build dams, to irrigate more land, and so forth. So one can predict safely, I think, uh, that the Nile Basin uh, is going to uh, have some difficulties coping uh, with uh, water, fresh water uh, scarcity. Reason number three, extraction of surface and ground water is increasing exponentially. Uh, I, can only, I only have time for one example here. Of course, it's, it's increasing. I think I'll go back for a moment. It's increasing uh, in part simply because of dam building activity, whether for multipurpose dams, irrigation dams, uh, or uh, diversion dams and so forth. China already has 22, over 22,000 dams, more than any other country, but it has a huge dam building uh, prospects uh, in the future. It will add thousands more. And that, of course, that is resulting in tremendous reduction in the water in, in China's uh, rivers. Uh, but China, for example, also uh, is considering uh, relief for its northern plains, which have a tremendous problem of water scarcity. This is merely uh, on the, it's not on the drawing boards, it's merely proposed. De the government in Beijing denies that it has any intention to do such a thing, but they're thinking about, some Chinese are proposing, uh, that a diversion canal be built on the great Brahmaputra River, the ninth largest river in the, in the world, and near Lhasa uh, to convey that water uh, through uh, tunneling and canals uh, over a long distance, all the way up to the Huangho or Yellow River, which feeds the uh, arid lands of northern China. Now, the speculation is that if they go to the expense of doing that, that they would perhaps extract as much as 200 billion cubic meters of water per annum. I don't know what that means to you. It doesn't mean numbers like that are hard to digest. But what it would represent would be 35% of the mean annual discharge of the Brahmaputra River, a huge amount of water which you cannot extract from that river without having an enormous impact on the two downstreamers, Bangladesh, over 50% depended upon that river for its freshwater supply, uh, and India, certainly in the, in the judgment of some, casus belli. Uh, between China and uh, uh, India in the event they actually go ahead with it. And of course, this accounts for the fact that just a few weeks ago you had a cartoon in the Indian press, what are China's plans for the Brahmaputra, showing China's hand uh, jabbing into the Brahmaputra River uh, to the chagrin of Bangladeshis uh, and Indians. W once again, the Chinese deny having any intent uh, to go in this direction. Reason four, International treaties governing freshwater resources are few and far between in many water-scarce parts of the world. Now, the truth, of course, is that there are thousands of water agreements and treaties uh, on the planet. The problem, of course, is that in the water-scarce parts of the world where the problem is most severe is where you have the fewest uh, agreements in existence. For example, there are no treaties, no agreements in regard to the Brahmaputra uh, among the Bangladesh uh, Chinese and Indian uh, governments, uh, which of course worsens the problem, increases the uncertainty uh, of the lower riparian states, Bangladesh and India, not knowing uh, what Chinese plans will be uh, 10 years, 20 years from now in the future. Between, just one further example, between Bangladesh and India, uh, Bangladesh of course is a, uh, is a well-watered country, it has some 57 rivers that are transboundary, that connect three of them with uh, Myanmar or Burma. 54 are shared with India. Well, this is 2012. After many years of negotiations, we have exactly one treaty uh, between India and Bangladesh, and it applies to one river, only the Ganges or Ganga, and it applies only to one dam, the famous Barak, uh, Faraka Baraj, uh, on, on a river that has a great many other barrages and dams. And perhaps worst of all, this is 2012. The treaty was signed in 1996 and was signed for 30 years. Its lifetime is 30 years unless renewed. So we have less than half of that stretch of time remaining to us uh, before 
of this treaty expires. And once again, there are 54 rivers shared, and we have an agreement in regard to one uh, only. My last reason, the world's water hotspots tend already to have lengthy histories of interstate tension uh, and uh, conflict. I've already mentioned uh, that on, in the Indus River Basin, the two main uh, co uh, co-riparians there are India and uh, Pakistan. Well, they reached their 65th birthday uh, this year, so, uh, independence and so forth. In that rather short period of time, there have been three wars, some would say three and a half wars between them. Well, they also happen to be nuclear weapon powers. They, are, they rank among the top 10 uh, countries in the world in terms of the size of their armed forces. Uh, and they have a great many issues, not just water uh, existing between them. So there are more than a few, if you look at the Tigris Euphrates or the Jordan or the Nile Basin uh, or the Mekong, you find similar patterns of historic rivalries and so forth, which then make it easier perhaps for uh, conflict to develop over water issues when reinforced by already existing uh, conflicts between them. This brings us to the end uh, and uh, something that kind of surprised me just a few days ago there was a public announcement of the contents of a United States national intelligence estimate that was uh, classified and was provided to, its, uh, to, to, a, to the U.S. government officials back in October. But we only learned a few weeks ago of its contents. I found them very interesting because, among other things, what they said was, you can sit back, you don't have to worry too much about the next 10 years from 2012 to 2022 because they said, yes, there will be increasing tensions over water between nations, but they said little likelihood of war so far as they could see. Uh, but, but knowing uh, the quickness with which 10 years passes, I found a particular interest that they said beyond 2022, the use of water as a weapon of war or a tool of terrorism will become more and more likely particularly in South Asia, India, the Middle East, uh, uh, that's us, uh, and North Africa. I leave you with that somewhat unsettling uh, thought. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>